Welcome to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast, Season 2. I'm your host, Kenny Shu, where we cover ideas of race, identity, and culture. Joining me today is my wonderful guest, Dr. Amy Wax. Uh, she is the Robert Mundheim Professor of Law at University of Pennsylvania. She is also clerked for the D.C. Circuit. She graduated from Columbia Law School, has worked for the Reagan-Bush administration, specializes in social welfare law and policy, and has argued in front of the Supreme Court. Dr. Wax, great to hear you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, I invited Dr. Wax on this platform to talk about a number of things, but most notably the recent uh, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard and UNC case, which my listeners are very intimately familiar with. Um, So why don't you give your initial thoughts on the case. Do you think that they got 100% right, 90% right, or you know less than that? Well, I think the overall result, and of course here we're talking about 257 pages, including the majority opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, then some concurrences and two dissents. So there's a lot of material there. But I think the fundamental holding and outcome of the case, which Justice Roberts, in his majority opinion, uh, puts forward, is sound, is valid. And I think it is also uh, beneficial just uh, socially and and more (coughs) generally and certainly educationally. And that bottom line is effectively to overrule the line of cases that permitted educational affirmative action and admissions, certainly at the university level, court has never permitted it uh, below the university level, as Mm -hmm. justified by the compelling reason of uh, benefits of pedagogical diversity. And the court effectively repudiates uh, that justification for using race conscious decision making. And that is both under the Equal Protection Clause and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, How uh, How important do you think that repudiation actually is the educational benefits of diversity, considering that you've worked in this sphere for a long time. How many ripple effects do you think that that's going to have? Well, first of all, there's the question of what will a fallout be? What what does the future hold in light of this decision? And I think that's, you know, (laughs) that's certainly the topic of, of widespread speculation and nobody knows for sure. But before I get into that, Um, I would just want to point out that the pedagogical benefits of diversity, I mean, Roberts, both implicitly and explicitly cast doubt on that justification and the evidence backing it up. And he does it, you know, in a couple of ways. He does it mainly by saying that the, the goals and justifications that have been articulated by the two schools in the case are just too uh, amorphous, too ill-defined, too muzzy to provide a tractable, reviewable standard under the Equal Protection Clause and give the schools too much discretion. Um, Focuses on the court's own role in reviewability, but I think it has broader implications uh, that those so-called compelling reasons Um, don't have any obvious endpoint that the courts can sink their teeth into, as in other uh, type cases where race is used and purported to be compelling. Um, And also the evidence behind it, you know, is very shaky and dubious of these so-called pedagogical benefits, pedagogical benefits of diversity. That is what has propped up the prior cases Um, So he's definitely casting doubt on that whole business of diversity having pedagogical benefits, um, which, you know, has been taken Mm -hmm. as a sacred item of faith, certainly among the educrats in elite institutions anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, in terms of, you know, what will happen now in the wake of this decision, um, the speculation ranges from... uh, from absolutely nothing, the universities will find ways to skirt the mandate, skirt the prohibitions, yeah. <clears throat> circumvent them, and they're already busily at work trying to do this. 
uh, mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways that appear neutral, but are arguably race motivated or race based. Um, all the way from that to some people yeah. saying, no, this is really going to change things. It is really going to make it harder for the universities to do what they've been doing, which is effectively to carve out places, you know, very scarce places for yeah. blacks, especially, and with the focus on what I would call underachieving minorities. That is those who would not get into these competitive schools on a colorblind basis. You're right. And it's going to be hard for them to engineer the same ratios and the, and the, the racial parity that they've achieved so far, not blacks, not just in the numbers representative of their percentage in the population, but exceeding their demographic mm -hmm. representation. It's going to be hard for them to do that without radically changing the standards that they use and raising all sorts of suspicions. Um, beyond education, I think this decision does potentially have a lot of ramifications. Uh, it basically says the default for the Equal Protection Clause, so that applies to all government action, yeah. right, is strongly colorblind. It's going right. to be really hard to overcome that in any context. Mm -hmm. And of course, the government has, you know, programs all over the place that are race conscious. Do not kid yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. they are deeply entrenched oh, definitely. Uh, and pervasive. So that's going to make those programs open to challenge. And of course, in the private sector, we have all the corporate initiatives, the media, journalism, entertainment, all of their DIE efforts, which necessarily have race conscious elements. They're not governed by the Equal Protection Clause or even by Title VI, which applies to federally funded ed schools, but they are governed by Title VII and by other parts of the Civil Rights Act, actually parts that are easy for people to sue on. Turns out there are lots of barriers to individual suits under Title VI anyway, um, but for you know these DIE programs, they're kind of sitting ducks. Um, yeah. So there could be lawsuits. Now there are other obstacles to lawsuits: standing, finding plaintiffs, that that sort of stuff. Right. But certainly, if we had a Republican administration and they took this this opinion seriously, they could really go after a lot of these corporations and other entities. And the ultimate goal would be just getting rid of DIE, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I read right. yesterday, and then I'll stop when I tell you about this, that the Disney uh, Corporation Committee, the Florida committee that, you know, participates in Disney's fate in Florida, because they do have all these grants under a uh, public aegis in Florida, Disney, they have decided to abolish and dismantle all of their DIE programs, which is pretty dramatic, actually. Wow. Uh, so, wow. Yeah. So that would be I did not cool, even see, okay. Uh, for any Republican administration, I don't see the Biden administration doing anything to, no. you know, move that along. They're, they were on the other side of the affirmative action case. Of course, they are going after legacies, you know, which mm -hmm. is ironic because they they love affirmative action, which is clearly discriminatory. Legacies are neutral, so not clearly discriminatory, but they're still going after them. So I think it depends on politics. It depends on getting lawsuits going. It depends on a lot on cultural shifts and public opinion. Uh, there are so many parameters here that are going to feed into the ramifications of this decision. Right. So I, I'm going to give my opinion on what percentage I think they got right. Okay. Um, right now, I think they got 70% right. You're talking about the Roberts opinion, the, the majority? Yes, I'm talking about the Roberts majority opinion, actually. Actually, that's a good specification. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's lots of other stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The Roberts majority opinion. I think they got 70% right, um, which is lower than I think a lot of my listeners wished or hoped or probably maybe expected of me. It's also lower than I hoped. Um, I think that not overturning Grutter, or sorry, Gruder, 
um, which says that you can use race as a factor in admissions the same way that they actually, that they actually overturned Roe v. Wade. Uh, I think that that gave universities, a, you know, too much leeway um, or they didn't, they never articulated, Roberts at least did not articulate the concept of merit, I think quite so precisely as we would have liked in his opinion, showing that universities, you know, because their, their, their interest and their public interest in public funding is commitment to excellence should have been prioritizing merit-based admissions. Uh, I think that those two things, I think, slightly diverge from the goal in which I hoped that this decision would do, which would be to snap our universities into merit-based processes. Okay. Well, I, um, I mean, I'll let you go on if you have more to say, but I have something to say on that topic. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, was Grutter overruled and did the court not say enough about merit? Um, first of all, I, I see this as effectively overruling Grutter. Uh, for the duration in the sense that all of the schools that practice affirmative action, their programs are riddled with the same defects as the Harvard and UNC programs, and it's hard to escape them. I mean, it's just not a lack of articulation of clear goals, which I think is very hard to do, frankly, and one could, I think, theoretically do it in another case, but given the way they talk about the benefits of diversity, it would be difficult but also he relies on the fact that in selective schools, there's definitely a negative effect on Asians, discrimination against Asians, which of course the schools deny, the media denies, but Roberts just puts that to bed, said, oh, come mm -hmm. on, there is, okay. Um, yeah, you know, that's he, part of the 70%, right, go ahead. <laughs> right, he relies on the fact that these kinds of reliance on race programs as a factor stereotype, engage in the kind of stereotyping that as a matter of law is not permissible. That in itself is interesting because I think some stereotyping is valid, but he seems to say, no, we're going to have a hard and fast rule that there's going to be no stereotyping by the government or government subsidized entities, uh, regardless of you know whether groups actually, generalizations are actually valid, which is, which is interesting. Um, finally, the sunsetting problem, right? Which mm -hmm, I don't, right. theoretically, I actually find shaky for reasons I can go into, but the court has reiterated over and over that it will only approve these programs if there is a definite durational endpoint. And there doesn't seem to be, nor has Harvard or UNC really come out and said when it's all going to be over with. And I don't think any other schools, you know, can do that either. So, you know, there are very great obstacles to maintaining any kind of affirmative action program anywhere. So I see that as effectively overruling Grutter. You know, you, your good. opinions can differ about whether there's room for other programs, but they kill it pretty dead. Now on the merit issue, I am, I really disagree with you here. Okay. Because, and I say this, you know, flippantly to people, the Equal Protection Clause does not incorporate the SATs. Uh, Title VI does in, in no mm -hmm. way mandates that universities or educational institutions have certain rationales or goals or of a certain type, right? They right. effectively, they, they carve out a narrow set of proscriptions, you can do whatever you want, but what you can't do is use race. So, you know, there is no mandate that universities be quote unquote meritocratic in the sense of valuing smarts, achievement, test scores, IQ, ability, you know, which to a large right. extent they still do, although less and less for all sorts of reasons. So mm -hmm. when Roberts, you know, Roberts is a pretty sophisticated guy and he understands, you know, the rationales behind conservatism when he says, well, we can't stop schools from reading essays about individuals overcoming obstacles and rapes might come in there. What he's really mm -hmm. saying is, you know, we don't have the power beyond our no race as just, you know, yeah. in the way they're using it, basically, um, to right. tell schools how to run their admissions office. 
I mean, okay, so let's, let's it's private, very interesting. You yeah. know, uh, take Harvard. There's a public private line that conservatives need, honor and need to honor because they don't want the government to take over everything, right? And yeah. quite frankly, you know, Harvard can do, they can have a lottery, they can value certain personality traits, as long as that's not a pretext for discrimination, which, you know, mm. is an important concern. Right. Uh, they can value legacies, they can value athletics, you know, they can value some girl in Omaha who runs a clothing drive and shows she's a social <laughs> justice warrior. I mean, we might think that's a bad idea. And as you said, it doesn't comport with the goal of excellence that, you know, we think of as universities advancing and there is public funding. So we have an interest, but where is that standard set out? Right. It's not yeah. set out in any legal document. Right. But we are stuck with, okay, now what does the Harvard admissions office do? And frankly, Roberts does not want to get into that, like meddle in that beyond, mm. well, race in itself, no. Right. Well, let's tug at this, let's tug at this line here because we seem, we have, there's, there's some delicacy here. Um, you, when you say the Equal Protection Clause prevents us from discriminating on the basis of race, what is, what does that mean? Is that, does that mean that we can do whatever we want so long as race is not a side constraint? Well, yeah. I mean, but yeah. what it means for race, you know, to, to base something on race. I mean, we now have a set of lower court decisions right. and challenges. Like is a shift to this neutral criterion or the set of ostensibly neutral criteria, is it really motivated by racial concerns? That is going to be the next frontier. So there's right. a case out of uh, the Fourth Circuit, Thomas Jefferson High School uh, recently decided pre-Harvard where mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson went from being a straight up exam school, you know, like Stuyvesant and Bronx Science, where, you know, the, that created a 70% Asian student body and hardly any blacks. It said, oh, we can't have that. So we're going to get rid of the exam and we're going to have something like a 10% program for middle schools and have other squishy criteria uh, for right. getting into this school. And a group of students challenged and said, oh, you only did that to get fewer Asians and more blacks. That was your motivation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's discriminatory. Right. The lower and they, they judge, argued it wasn't. Yeah, the lower court yeah. judge said, yeah, you're right. The district judge, the, the fourth circuit said, uh, no, you yeah. don't show that. Notice the political valence on this, right? When it comes to yeah. discriminating against Asians, the lower court Trump or Reagan judge was very sympathetic to that, to that uh, yeah. argument. The fourth but what's odd is it. that, right, but what's odd is that, you know, I guess in traditional conservative jurisprudence, you know, the court would or libertarian jurisprudence, the court would sort of wash their hands of this whole thing and say, you know, maybe if it, if there wasn't any explicit motivation based on race, then it wasn't discrimination. Right. Well, that would be setting a very high standard for proving discriminatory motive, right? And there's right. no disparate impact. You have to have intent under the Equal Protection Clause. So you've got to prove intent. Proving intent is hard. And yeah. I don't know, you know, there are other cases. There's so are you saying that the, that the plaintiffs here actually proved intent? Well, I, the plaintiffs in the Harvard UNC case or in the Thomas yes. Jefferson case? In the Harvard UNC case. Well, there was a lot of talk about Asians getting lower ratings on average on, let's say, personality, subjective measures, and a lot right. of, you know, Beating, but Harvard up. never argued that uh, was intentional. This is motivated by the desire to keep them down, but the court never really decided that, right? I personally think it's a weak argument just because 
the students for fair admissions who represent the Asian students, for them to argue that any disparate impact of a measure the school might value, like personality, is per se discrimination. I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, is a weak argument and it's it's inconsistent with saying, well, whether if there's a disparate impact in academic criteria, that's fine. You know, mm. that you know, more many more yeah. Asians will get in with high scores than blacks. So why can't the opposite be true for right. personality? Well, it's, that's, that's very funny then, because the Asians were using a disparate impact. Sorry, the plaintiffs were using a disparate impact they rationale were. to show discrimination. And in moving in, pointing in opposite directions. I mean, what's ironic is the whole diversity business is founded on the notion that different groups and ethnicities and races on average are different, you know, culturally or in their interests or in their abilities True. or whatever. And that's why we need diversity. If every group were the cookie cutter mirror image of every other, like where would multiculturalism be? Where would diversity be? I mean, mm. it, and it isn't true as a practical matter. I mean, you're Asian. I'm not, but I'm not offended by the idea that no Asians tend to be interested in science. They tend to be interested in Mm -hmm. Music, they tend not yeah. to like this as much. They they have different. They have maybe more different personalities. On average, we're not talking about every person here. That's a straw man, of course. Yeah. Um, and I'm not offended by that. I mean, I'm a Jew. You know, yeah. when people say, "Well, the profile of Jewish personalities and what they bring to a school is different from, let's say, you know, wasp from the Midwest," I'm like, yeah. I, 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 there is a certain kind of um, panoply of traits that, that many Jews exemplify. Now, all of that's getting diluted because there's so much assimilation and mixing. The distinctiveness of populations varies a good deal. Um, but what's the bottom line here? I mean, if personality measures that Harvard wants to use end up eliminating Asians... That in itself, I don't think, is actionable. It has to be shown that this is just a proxy for getting rid of Asians. And that's hard because you have need a smoking gun on intent. Wow. And okay, so that's very interesting. I think that's, that's what should be required. But, you know, getting that smoking gun on, you know, what we're really doing when we ask for, oh, creativity or leadership, whatever the hell, I don't know what mm -hmm. they're doing. Um, so this, yeah. And so this, this problem that you just put out, Dr. Wax is, is, I, I guess I can say this now, um, or I've sort of wanted to say this for a long time and I didn't really know, but you helped me to formulate this. I think the elegance of this case, um, is that the plaintiffs successfully used the leftist disparate impact rationale against the left. Sure. Oh, they did it. I mean, they, they, uh, they use their own weapons against them. Absolutely. Uh, but I think they kind of bought into it themselves, which is disturbing. I mean, I don't know if they had their fingers crossed behind their back. The, you know, the, every group is cookie. No, stereotyping is never valid. Every group is a cookie cutter mirror of every other. That is not a winning strategy for the right in the long run, uh -huh. you know, because it's not, it's not realistic. I mean, we can use the term race realism, which has been freighted with all of these horrible, horrible negative connotations. Yeah. What great, you know, there is a version of race realism, which is, let's face it, you know, groups have distinct cultures, distinct interests, distinct orientations, especially recently arrived in this country, certainly in their native land. Yeah. And as nasty as it sounds, Harvard is entitled to, you know, favor some traits over others. Now, of course, that was used against the Jews back when. Right. right? Uh, and right. The, the accusation was made, oh, they're just trying to keep Jews out. You know, that's why they value the big man on campus, genteel wasp profile. Yeah. Uh, well, there's part of me as a conservative, I'm going to have to tell you, that says if they want to keep Harvard waspy because they think that those those ethos, those values, those practices, that outlook 
is worth preserving. I'm not sure that, you know, we ought to be agitating against that. I mean, as yes. I do, I who went to Yale, it would seem to be against my self-interest, right? Well, the critical theorist would say, yeah, you would say that as a Jew. Well, because I, why? Because, because we, Jews right now are overrepresented in the Ivy League. Right. They're now overrepresented in the Ivy so League. So you have the privilege of saying that. Well, no, I think the reason I would say that, wouldn't I, is because I think the Jews have an interest in preserving their own institutions as quintessentially Jewish institutions. Mm. I mean, I see the argument that if the, if the people of the Ivies want to keep the Ivies wasp because they value the, this wasp ethos, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then it follows from that that Israel can keep Israel Jewish because they value you know, that profile. And that is yeah. so contra the upper middle class, you know, dogmas uh, and and kind of orthodoxies that are all around us. Oh, no, you can't do that. Right. Yeah, no. Uh, if Harvard wanted to keep it waspy, um, itself waspy, then I would I guess I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it. Um, if that, if also the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in Title VII were diluted, you know, um, the, the problem that I see is that the reality that we live in today is that the Civil Rights Act of that and is, has is gained great power in our legal discourse. Right. And uh, therefore would attack, you know, such a waspy university but would not then go on and do the same thing towards, you know, discrimination from blacks to Asians or discrimination from blacks to whites or anything like that, or from Jews to Asians or that kind of thing. Well, I mean, the Civil Rights Act of 64 in Title VI, which applies to educational institutions, right, right. only applies to institutions that take federal funds. In contrast to Title VII, which applies to employers across the board, right, without mm. that condition, so now we have the government meddling in private action, right? For universities, if you take federal money, now of course almost all of them do. You know, Harvard take a ton, right? So then the government can reach in and regulate. But yeah, it wouldn't be possible to discriminate against Jews at the in the Ivies, at least not overtly now under the Civil Rights Act. And the other thing that I think the reason that, you know, the whole, this is a bastion of our traditional wasp ethos and we want to keep it that way. Why mm -hmm. that went by the board is not just the law, but also yeah. wasps kind of, you know, immolated themselves. I mean, you know, the preservation of wasp hegemony and culture mm -hmm. uh, was uh, weakening in the society as a whole, right? Uh, yeah. For all sorts of good, you know, this is a mixed bag. I, I think there are all sorts of compelling and good reasons why um, the wasp hegemony kind of gave up on itself. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's not necessarily all beneficial, frankly, because right. there's a benefit to separate and distinct cultures. Frankly, our country was founded on Anglo-American traditions, legacies, institutions, persona, values, orientation. It was founded on those and those, you know, helped make it a great success. So I shed a little bit of a tear for it, but you're right. You know, the civil rights act said, okay, can't discriminate on, I guess, on the basis of religion, uh, ethnicity, uh, mm -hmm. race, sex, and that's it. But if you want to discriminate on the basis of playing the violin, you know, or mm -hmm. wanting to be a scientist because we want creative, you know, script writers that makes a fun place and an interesting place. If you want to go through all that, I don't know what the government yeah. wants to meddle with that. I mean, I see Roberts in giving that loophole paragraph, which then he warns is not really a loophole, right? Don't abuse it. Yeah. He is kind of signaling, 
hey, you know, we're not taking over the Harvard admissions office. Yep. Yep. Oh, I wanted to, I want to ask you a question, but before I want to ask you a question, I want to make sure we're on the same, we have the same set of facts. So you do believe, do you believe as I do that if Asians were admitted only, or if, if Harvard admitted only based on academic ability, Asian, the Asian population would increase? I think absolutely. Just looking at the SATs and the right. way Asians, you know, they score way above their, they punch way above their weight on these standardized tests. Let me tell you. So then, then let, then give me your honest reason about why you think Harvard has a lower Asian population and would be admitted academically. Why, why I think a lower ac Asian population would be good no, why, why, why Harvard has a lower Asian population than than they would if they admitted on the oh, basis on, of on, on merit. Well, yeah, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. First of all, Harvard has never been a pure meritocracy, academic meritocracy for admissions ever. Okay, neither have and none of the Ivies have. Some to more degrees than others. Right. They act, Harvard does have what you would call academic admits. They're very shrewd. They're very clever. They do find a critical mass of people across the country who are top, top flight, you know, students. Yeah. They seek them they out do. and they have some way of finding them. I mean, I'm going to mention Charles Murray, you know, he's from Iowa. They managed to figure out that he was someone to, to admit. Okay. Um, yeah. but they also have other priorities, right? They want, well, diversity now. They think it's like cat's meow, has all these educational benefits. I think, frankly, most of that is just bogus. It's a luxury belief, but okay, yeah. they want it. Sure. Um, secondly, legacies, because they want to keep the institution going and their legacies are loyal and they're rich, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the big donor kids get a huge boost. That's a very tiny number of people. They want musicians. They want athletes. They want uh, people who are going to major in English, you know, to feed their departments, keep their professors happy. Uh, they want creative yeah. types for their, you know, hasty pudding uh, and Harvard Lampoon. Oh, I mean. Yeah. All of these priorities are in the mix. Geographical dispersion. You know, they want people from all over the country. And what that means is that although academic criteria are not unimportant by any stretch, and they want people they predict are going to be like the big creative money makers and movers and shakers, which doesn't necessarily correspond perfectly to who gets the 800s. Let me tell you. Mm. Okay, so, so far... Okay. East Asians are punching below their weight when they get out in terms of their scores. South okay. Asians are punching above their weight in terms of leadership positions. I mean, different, different groups and different ethnicities translate their academic acumen into different roles so far in society. Uh, right. And they're very aware of that. They, they would never talk about it publicly. Believe me. It's all mm. in the cover. All right. Yeah. But having said that, Asians are so cleaning up on the SATs and the like um, that even the way Harvard does things, if they, if they didn't change what they did, the number of them would rise. The estimate is they'll, they'll big be 50% right. or something along those lines, right? And then the question is, you know, is that good or bad? I mean, people like Steven Pinker thinks, oh, they should have a pure academic test and forget the rest of it because the rest of it is so manipulable. It's just luxury belief yeah. stuff, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, me, I don't know. I, I mean, I very much value intellect because I think our, our society and our culture is so technologically intensive. There's, it's so important that we have smart, competent people 
at the helm, right? That yeah. we really need to emphasize that. And it's real, you know? I mean, intellectual differences, cognitive ability, it's real, it's predictive. And when I hear about these DIE initiatives, let's get more Hispanic and black air traffic controllers, right? Be very afraid. I mean, that is scary stuff, as as mean as that sounds. Uh, because, you know, I saw a study that air traffic controllers have incredibly high IQ. Well, you kind of expect that, you know, given the job that they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, reasonable minds can differ about this. I'm more meritocratic than most people. But I recognize that we need conservatives believe in a small footprint for government. That means there's a lot of room for private institutions to decide how they're going to run their railroad and they're going to make stupid decisions and, you know, fashionable faddish decisions and they might shoot themselves in the foot, but we have to let them do that. Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you've used this word meritocratic, I think mostly in the context of academic merit, but you said something just, yeah, but you just said something that was, that could signify that maybe you do believe that Asians are less meritocratic in other ways, such as actual leadership, particularly East Asians, because you said that South Asians are overrepresented in the leadership positions in America comparatively especially compared with East Asians, which I believe is true. Well, okay, Um, but merit is a very slippery word here. mm. You're absolutely right in that even though I say, well, merit is primarily academic, certainly for admissions purposes, there are other ways to, you know, to incorporate, there are ways to incorporate a broader sense of merit in that, you know, the proof in the pudding, the achievement, the outcome. Uh, And I, I agree with that. So I think part of what Harvard is doing with merit is not just what did you get on the SAT, but given what you got on the SAT, what can we expect from you? And that's a sociological question, right? That we can broaden our lens and say, well, now we can look at how different groups controlling for incoming numbers do in society. And that, you know, that is a form of meritocracy admitting clever, creative people for the Harvard lampoon. That's, that's a merit part of the meritocracy, arguably, um, Mm -hmm. admitting people who are great musicians. You could argue that anything that has to do with human achievement and what people do, what they achieve in various realms, I think can, can arguably and properly be grouped under the meritocratic umbrella. I think what should not be placed under there for sure is any trait that you are endowed with. I mean, of course your IQ, but your IQ put to good use, that's merit, but you know, your race, uh, Mm. whether you come from Iowa, I mean, that's not meritocratic. That's just chance. Right. Right. Um, you know, your religion, uh, any of that fixed, those fixed elements or traits, that's not merit. So I'm not mm. confining merit to like your SAT scores, your grades, um, at, or a, even a science project you did that's part of your admissions file, but anything related to individual traits, a, achievements, the, the agent as an active agent to achieve excellence. I don't know if, you know, you're happy with that definition, but I think it's legitimate. Well, I only, I I touched on this one because you are, um, you're going into territory that, you know, a lot of Asian Americans discourse around themselves. Um, Uh like why are we less represented management, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, but two, you know, because, you made uh, some comments that I'm sure you're aware of that led Penn Penn Law to sanction you, blah, 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 et cetera, right. about Asian immigration. And um, perhaps I'm wondering if you would like to expound upon, 
you know, your position on Asian immigration, the news article that, that I read, which is slanted from NBC News, says Penn Law to sanction professor who says U.S. better off, quote unquote, with fewer Asians. Right. Okay. Um, what is the real context? Just lifted like totally out of context. I mean, you're absolutely yeah. right that, you know, they are sanctioning me. They're in the process of sanctioning me because I say things you don't say in academia. I mean, what you can say in the universities now is so painfully narrow that it's just kind of a dead zone intellectually. It's interesting that the affirmative action case has not spawned one program to look at the pros and cons because nobody's allowed to say anything good about the abolition of affirmative action. That's considered, you know, a direct insult to Black students, well, how can you run a, an educational institution hmm. along those lines? It's absurd, right? It's like a madrasa. But anyway, back to yeah. Asians, that line, that fragment is lifted from a discussion I was having with George Lee, who's a friend of mine, who is one of the hmm. principals behind the uh, Students for Fair Admissions, who's a New York Asian who is very conservative, if, if I may you know, characterize him that way. And we were having yeah. a discussion about why Asians vote for Democrats when it would seem that that party policies are not in their interests. Was, the party is staunchly opposed to, you know, pure meritocratic measures, loves affirmative action. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't understand why Asians vote for Democrats, because I don't really think the Democratic pol party policies are in any way good for them, uh -huh. given their values, you know, that yeah. they are entrepreneurial, all of that. Um, and I said, until we can change these voting patterns, which I'm not sure we're capable of, you know, I think the country is better off, you know, not bringing in large numbers of Asians because they're just, frankly, I was, I was being totally partisan about it. I said they're going to vote for Democrats. I'm a Republican, you know? Uh, but I, I, I don't really see anything wrong with saying that uh, uh -huh. because Democrats are sent, they bring in people they know will vote for them. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And immigration is discretionary. I mean, Asians have yeah. a lot of very positive traits too, but this goes deeper and this is far more, I mean, this is controversial, which is, you know, when you bring in large numbers of people from non-Western cultures and even non-Anglo cultures, I mean, we brought in a lot of Europeans and we insisted quite aggressively that they assimilate. Well, of course, that's, that's in the past, right? Right. Um, then you do change the culture, you do change the country. Uh, and that doesn't, you know, as, as Eric Kaufman and Britain, a very good demographer, has pointed out, that doesn't mean that you have anything against any particular Asian person, right? Or that yeah. you don't recognize all of their positive traits, because I do, or that you don't have Asian friends, because I do. Yeah. It means that you're stepping back and taking a broader view of yeah. what big demographic shifts mean for a country that frankly until pretty recently had a fairly distinct culture firmly rooted in post-enlightenment european values and peoples and practices which has its own cultural stamp and you know frankly i mean suppose we replaced half the population in the United States with the population of, of Yemen or, yeah. you know, of uh, Mexico, I, that wouldn't change anything. Uh, it would. Yeah, it certainly would. I mean, that's just yeah. realism about cultural difference. And, you know, the Democrats are so conflicted, the left, about cultural difference. On the one hand, oh, we celebrate multiculturalism. There are cultural differences. They enrich everybody. They create diversity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, how dare you suggest that there are these average cultural differences and that you might have a preference for one over the other, <laughs> like a preference for your own, maybe? Yeah. Right. How dare you have a preference for your own? That's not allowed. Yeah. So yeah. That's what we're dealing with here. Mm. Yeah. 
No, I mean, it's, could you, could you tell me one thing that might happen if the U S became significantly more, let's say East Asian? Well, I think there would be, I've, I've spoken about this a lot more kind of conformity, a lot more statism and encouragement of, uh, government, you know, involvement in, in programs and regulation. I think there would be a denigration of, you know, core commitments, individualistic commitments, like a big one is free expression, free speech. I mean, I have met young Asian people, uh, and especially women, yeah, I am going to say this, who treat the First Amendment like some quirky fetish of white people that they ought to get over. <laughs> All right. And that is scary to me because I consider free expression to be at the very core of our legacy culture. You know, the one that was nurtured over hundreds and hundreds of years in good old merry old England that, you know, the founders brought with them. And that is absolutely essential to our character and our success uh, and our creativity and our audacity and our individualism and our boldness, which has produced so many good things. Now, admittedly, it's tempered yeah. with traditionalism of various sorts. It's a whole profile. I mean, I got into a lot of trouble by saying to Glenn Lowry, you know, I worry that the spirit of liberty doesn't beat in their breast, the Whiggish spirit of liberty, suspiciousness towards big government, towards government regulation, towards government telling you what to do, yeah, towards any big organization telling you what to do, towards a premium placed on acquiescing to the powers that be, not making waves, right? slavishly mm -hmm. following the elite ethos. I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of Asians who